the authorial model is to underscore the fact that God, as the creator, is operating on a different level, causally speaking, than the um, agents within the creation. This is the KKT Show. Dr. James Anderson is the Carl W. McMurray Professor of Theology and Philosophy and the Academic Dean for RTS Global and New York. He also has a PhD in Computer Simulation from the University of Edinburgh. He is an ordained minister in the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church. He specializes in philosophical theology, religious epistemology, and Christian apologetics. His research and writing focuses on the presuppositionalism of Cornelius Van Til, particularly his advocacy of the transcendental argument. Dr. Anderson, it is a huge honor for me to have you as my first guest on the show. It was a pleasure to speak to you. Right. So I'm going to begin. Um, Dr. Anderson, what, what led to your interest in apologetics, especially presuppositional apologetics? If, if... Sure. Yeah. So it's a, it's a bit of a long story, so I'll, I'll try and keep it uh, short-ish. Um, so I was raised uh, in a in a Christian home. So uh, you know I was uh, went to church, um, believed all the things that a, an evangelical Christian would believe. Um, but it really wasn't until my my teenage years that I made a personal commitment that that it became my own faith. I, I came to own it and commit my life to Christ. Um, and I went to university and I studied engineering, and uh, that was that went well and then I, I worked in a research department in the university doing doing computer interface research but uh, working in that environment as a Christian was quite challenging because there's a lot of uh, very smart um, unbelievers there you know most of the people I worked with were not were not Christians but they were very smart some were quite outspoken atheists or at least skeptics and uh, when I got into conversations, I felt that I hadn't really got good answers. So I started reading apologetics material, largely as a sort of a self-defense mechanism to, to protect myself against being humiliated or um, made out to be, you know, it's one of these uh, fundamentalists who just believes things without having any good reasons for them. So I, I started reading in, in Christian apologetics, but mainly it would be what would be called now uh, classical or evidentialist apologetics. So, so Norman Geisler's books, um, Josh McDowell. And uh, I got interested in theology and philosophy around the same time. So I was reading quite a bit of theology and philosophy. And uh, I sort of stumbled into reformed theology. And so uh, I was reading about uh, you know Calvinism and uh, reformed theology more broadly. And uh, started going to a, um, a a Christian bookstore that had a lot of reform books. And in that bookstore, they had an apologetics section. And uh, in the apologetics section of the bookstore, they had a book by by John Frame. You're probably familiar with John Frame. And uh, his book was Apologetics to the Glory of God. And I just saw the title of that book. I mean, I didn't even pick it up. I didn't op even open it. But just the title of that book, Apologetics to the Glory of God, sort of, you know, blew my mind. Wow, that's that's a new way to think about apologetics. So it's not it's not actually all about me. It's about uh, about giving glory to God. And what does that mean? How do you do apologetics to the glory of God? So I, I, I bought the book and I read it. And that was my first exposure to presuppositional apologetics. I'd never even heard of it. Uh, didn't even know there was a debate about how to do apologetics. So I, I read that and, uh, and it brought about a kind of a paradigm shift in the way that I thought about apologetics, not just apologetics, but in fact, about everything, about theology, about philosophy, about ethics, about science. Um, but that was that was a real turning point for me in in thinking about um, method in apologetics and what it, if you have reformed theology, what does that mean for how you approach apologetics? And so I um, uh, I, I looked up some of the references in that book uh, in apologetics 
to the glory of God, there's a lot of references to Cornelius Van Til, also uh, a reference to a debate by a guy called Greg Barnson with a guy called Gordon Stein. And so I looked that up and that was quite a paradigm shift for me. So it was really um, through John Frame's book and then starting to read Cornelius Van Til, some of the works of uh, Greg Barnson, that I, I was brought into the world of presuppositional apologetics. And, um, and I've been, you know, that's where I've been ever since. I think my, my views have been um, uh, refined over the years, but still I have a basic commitment to, to doing apologetics from a presuppositional perspective. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, that does answer the question, but that leads me to another question. If you assume reformed anthropology, and which implies the noetic effects of sin. Can you simultaneously affirm uh, some sense of neutrality with the unbeliever? Because I have some few reformed friends over here and, and some of them affirm the doctrines of grace. So that would include reformed, the, a reformed anthropological view and therefore the noetic effects of sin. But they also seem to have some sort of an understanding of, of, a, of a neutral stance with the unbeliever. Now, as far as I understand the noetic effects of sin, it seems to me to be impossible for us to have a, a, a neutral stance with the unbeliever when it comes to, well, the most principal issues, which uh, I guess um, the epistemological issues that presuppositional apologetics deals with. So I guess my question is, is it, is it possible? Can, can you hold to a reformed anthropological view and simultaneously hold to uh, some sort of uh, uh, a neutrality with the unbeliever, or would that be a logical contradiction? And it, it, it maybe wouldn't be an obvious logical contradiction, because if it were obvious, then I think your friends would see it as well. But I think mm -hmm. that when you start from the standpoint of reformed theology, and it's, it's not so much the doctrine of sin, although I, I think that's relevant here, I'll, I'll come back to that. It's more, of our, it's more about our doctrine of revelation that really excludes the the idea of neutrality. So according to Reformed theology, God has revealed himself in nature through natural revelation, such that, as Romans 1 says, uh, God's eternal power and divine nature are clearly perceived in what has been made. So there's no neutrality in the creation itself. The creation displays the glory of God, but also God has revealed himself especially through the scriptures and through the incarnation, through Christ. So there's this category of special revelation. And what, what follows from that is that God intends us to not to think in a neutral way or to approach anything from a neutral way, uh, neutral stance, but to submit ourselves to his revelation. So if God has authoritatively revealed himself in nature and in scripture, and uh, we uh, ought to submit to that authority, then uh, there's no, there's no uh, uh, room for what we might call autonomy for um, treating ourselves as the ultimate standard or treating ourselves as independent of any external authorities. And there's no, no, no uh, room for a neutral perspective as well, because either you're going to be reasoning in submission, acknowledging God's revelation, reasoning in, in submission to God's revelation, or you're not. Or you're going to be reasoning um, in uh, submission to some other authority, because we all have to have some ultimate authority. Um, and so we can't be neutral about that. So I think just what we might call a reformed epistemology, that is a reformed theory of knowledge and reasoning and truth, uh, rules out any stance of neutrality, that you can't approach any topic from a strictly neutral perspective, which is neither, neither Christian nor non-Christian, neither in submission to God's revelation or not in submission to God's revelations. There's no position of indifference. Now, the, the doctrine of sin, I think, would, uh, the reform doctrine of, of sin and total depravity um, adds another factor to that, because what scripture says is that uh, those who are uh, fallen in sin, who are unregenerate, cannot submit to God's law. They're hostile to God. They're hostile to God's revelation. And so they're not coming at it from a neutral perspective either. Again, this just reinforces the idea that either, well, as Christ himself says, he who is not with me is against me. There's no, there's no middle position there. Either you're with Christ, you're for Christ, or you're against Christ. And unbelievers by nature are uh, in rebellion against God's revelation, against God's law. So there's no position of neutrality there. Now, where people get a little confused here is that they think if there's no neutrality, 
then there's no common ground between a believer and unbeliever. And uh, presuppositionalists such as uh, Cornelius Van Til and John Frame have uh, emphasized that while presuppositionalists deny that there's any neutral ground, there's no neutral perspective or neutral stance that we can take towards any of these issues, there is common ground. But that common ground isn't neutral ground. And this is, this is where I think presuppositionalism differs from other approaches to apologetics. We don't want to say that the common ground is some neutral set of first principles or reasoning um, principles or, or um, the scientific method, the historical method, that there's no neutral uh, methodology here. But the common ground is in fact found in common grace, right? So we have this category of common grace that even though human beings have fallen in sin, God doesn't allow fallen human beings to follow through completely with their rebel intellectual rebellion, uh, which would lead them to utter futility and skepticism, but rather God in his grace uh, restrains unbelievers so that they can still know the truth, at least some truths about things, they can still reason about things, they can still do science, they can still do um, historical research, they can know the difference between right and wrong to a certain degree. Um, and so that common ground is found partly in common's grace, God's common uh, restraining grace, but also in the fact that every human being is made in the image of God. So the doctrine of the Imago Dei also gives us common ground, because what that means is that the image of God is stamped on the consciousness of every human being, whether they acknowledge it or not. I mean, even an atheist who denies the existence of God is still made in the image of God as far as we are concerned. And so that, that common image of God uh, and the, the uh, common grace that allows us to reason with unbelievers gives us a starting point for discussions. But it doesn't mean that we can take, a, say, you know, let's approach this from a sort of indifferent, uh, neutral perspective and try and build our way to uh, uh, the Christian faith. Right, yeah, that, that makes sense. Although um, initially it seemed to me to be easier to, to approach the unbeliever with, with facts about the resurrection of Christ or, or maybe uh, arguments from philosophy and, and lead on to that, the step-by-step um, -step approach, which uh, I learned from your class, uh, the classical apologetics, where, where they use the step-by-step um, -step approach, mm -hmm. which, 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 does have, which does seem to have validity, and yet um, at the foundational level, might not be as biblically accurate as presuppositionalists. The presuppositional methodology might be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there are some real differences in the way that a classical apologist would make the case for a Christian faith and the presuppositionalist would. But we don't also want to uh, overstate some of the differences. And, uh, you know, presuppositionists like myself are happy to talk about facts. I'm happy to talk about the, the historical evidence that we have for Within the resurrection. The framework of, of right, the what exactly. So we, we, we want to talk about facts and evidences. But we also want to talk about the worldview through which we interpret those facts and evidences. We, we don't hold this view that facts just speak for themselves or that evidence can be interpreted from some neutral perspective. But while we talk about evidence, we also want to talk about the, the presuppositionals, uh, the presuppositional framework or worldview that we bring to interpret the evidence. Because, of course, if you come to the evidence for the resurrection from a naturalistic perspective, assume with naturalistic presuppositions, then what's going to be the best uh, interpretation or the best explanation for those evidences is going to be very different than if you're coming from the perspective of someone who believes in the God of Scripture. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. So, so we've we've delved into that a bit, and um, now we'll go to something else that that that's really interested me about you, which is your work on the law of non-contradiction. Uh, the laws of logic, and um, mm -hmm. I read that paper. That that's the first paper I read about presuppositional apologetics. I think. Oh, and then that well, that fascinated me. So, so I I thought, I thought I'd delve into it a bit more, and um, yeah. So if if I can ask, no, I I wouldn't. That wouldn't be uh, really. I'm not going to ask you to summarize the argument, but I will ask you one thing because uh, while I read the whole thing, the the first thing that struck me was about the issue of conceivability. And I, I, I thought maybe I, I ought to read up on this. And then I found a paper online, which I later found out was written by Dr. Alex Malpas. And he mentioned conceivability as grounds for metaphysical possibility. 
So I wondered about that, and, and to my amazement, I saw you and uh, Dr. Alex Malpas in a discussion just, I guess, three weeks prior. So I listened to that interview. It was an amazing interview, and I suggest all, all those you who listen to this to watch that interview. But in that particular interview, you, you mentioned something, and that's what I want to ask you about. So uh, it isn't so much conceivability as much as it is intuition that might be the guide to metaphysical possibility. Would that be uh, an accurate, uh, some, uh, accurate summation of what you said during the first part of the interview? Yeah, um, I, can, I can certainly answer that question, but it might be helpful for our, our viewers or listeners to back up a bit and talk about the context that led to that discussion. Right, Is that yeah. okay if we do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So, right, so, and, and I would be happy to summarize this, this argument from the laws of logic. So the background to this is what, one of the distinctive claims of presuppositionalists has been that the reason itself depends on the existence of God. So if, if the God of the Bible did not exist, then it would be not it wouldn't even be possible for us to reason about anything and presuppositionists have made that argument in different ways for example uh, greg barnson would talk about the laws of logic the laws of logic and what what worldview do we need to account for the laws of logic and this came up in his debate with gordon stein gordon stein was a materialist who's, who believed that only material things exist and barnson nailed him on the point that the laws of logic, if they're real, can't be material things. So a, a materialist has no place for the laws of logic. But I don't think Barnson fully developed that argument from the laws of logic to, to take it all the way to, to at least theism, at least to the existence of a personal God. And so what I wanted to do, and I, I co-authored a paper with my colleague and friend, Greg Welty, arguing from the laws of logic that if there are laws of logic, then there must be a God. They, they imply the existence of God because once we, once we think about what the laws of logic are, that essentially they are necessarily true propositions, then we can argue that there must be a mind to be the ground of those propositions and that must be a mind that exists necessarily. It can't be our minds because our minds are finite and contingent. There must be a necessarily infinite, uh, necessarily existent infinite mind um, that could ground laws of logic and other uh, true propositions as well. So anyway, that was the background. Now, uh, Alex Malpass is a British philosopher who um, has uh, written quite a bit, some, some published academically, some more informally on his blog. Um, he's, a, he's an atheist or at least a, 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 a skeptic and has sort of um, critiqued a lot of presuppositionalist arguments. And, um, and he wrote a, a blog post a um, number of years ago now uh, in response to this argument from uh, the, in the paper that Greg Welty and I wrote, The Lord of Non-Contradiction, and um, basically uh, identified three, what he thought were three weaknesses in the, in the argument. And uh, we actually had some correspondence. He's a, he's a very uh, friendly, congenial guy and, um, you know, a very sharp thinker. Yeah, and the interview uh, really put that out. I love the interview. Yeah, I mean, both, I thought it was fantastic. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed the exchange yeah. because it, I, it was good. You know, there wasn't any sort of um, it wasn't competitiveness. It was, a, yeah, it was, it was a right. Very, it was, yeah. You know, like, I mean, we, we, we both had our positions. We defended right. our positions. But hopefully we did so in a friendly and uh, intellectually uh, respectful way. So anyway, he, he, he published, uh, actually published in a journal, a critique of our argument. And that was the topic of our discussion. And one of the, one of the questions uh, he raised early on was uh, whether the law of non-contradiction, on, on what basis can we say that the law of non-contradiction is a necessary truth? And he, yeah. he asked some questions about what, what do we mean by a necessary truth or what kind of necessity are we talking about here? And how do we actually know that the law of, the, the law of non-contradiction is a necessary truth? And we had argued in the paper, basically from a sort of conceivability argument that while we can conceive of possible worlds in which um, things are different than they are now, so we can conceive you of a possible even world. Mentioned, uh, I'm sorry, but you even mentioned Graham Priest's dialetheism uh, in the footnote to the paper. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. so we, yeah. we did acknowledge that there are some philosophers, I'm a minority, but it is a serious position, that have defended um, what are called non-classical or sub-classical logics that uh, don't accept the law of non-contradiction, or at least don't accept it as a universal principle. In other words, 
there are some systems of logic that allow for logical contradictions so that you have to modify uh, what you say about the law of non-contradiction. And Graham Priest is probably the best known philosopher defending that. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, if you do do any reading really in philosophy of logic, um, you're going to come across this sooner or later. And uh, actually, I, I come across it in some of my other work on theological paradox. So that's that's really how I came became aware of this position. But as far as the the argument from logic goes, what Greg and I said was that, yes, there are these other logical systems, but that's okay. That's not a problem for our argument, because if you accept any laws of logic at all, if you think that there are uh, any laws that, um, that are necessary principles that we can use to deduce one truth from another truth or other truths, then the argument will work, because the argument, all, the, all you need for the argument to work is one necessary truth and so if there's one law of logic that is a necessary truth it doesn't have to be the law the law of non-contradiction although that's one that's most people accept you see i mean most people uh have this uh intuition uh that would probably be the best um word to use it that um a statement can't be both true and false in the same sense or a proposition can't be both true and false and there's a sense in which you have to be a philosopher to be able to defend uh, any other position than that, because it takes a bit of sophistication and thought to defend the idea that there can be true contradictions. So anyway, um, Dr. Malpass and I were sort of back and forth about um, how we deal or how our argument would deal with the position that denied the, the, the law of non-contradiction. And you probably followed that. We actually agreed at the end that our argument doesn't depend on the law of non-contradiction being true or any of the classical laws of logic um, because any any other necessary truth would do. So if you think that one plus one equals two, a mathematical truth, if you think that that is not just true, but uh, necessarily true, in other words, it couldn't have been otherwise, it couldn't have been that one plus one equals three or something else, then uh, that's enough to get the argument going as well. You can still make the argument for the existence of God from that. And, uh, you know, philosophers debate how we know which truths are necessary truths. Do we know it by a sort of direct uh, intuition? Do we know it by some test of conceivability? In other words, um, if I can conceive of something being otherwise, then it, it, it can't be a necessary truth. And, you know, th these are important debates but they're, they're a little tangential to our argument because if you can, if you can get someone to admit that there's at least one, one thing that's true that could not have been false, that could not have been otherwise, you've got a necessary truth and that's enough to make the argument for the existence of a necessary, a necessary mind. Right. Yeah, it was that interview that cleared the whole thing, up, at least from, yeah, it was that interview that helped me understand that you don't really need to defend the laws of logic as much as you need to defend a necessary truth. If yeah. if even one necessary truth exists, then the argument would, would follow logically. And yeah. Yeah. So and even someone like Graham Priest, I mean Graham Priest uh holds to you know non-classical logic has defended that, but he still thinks that there are other laws of logic. There are other sort of um principles of deduction that you have to use if you're going to argue argue logically. Um, so you just you just find another uh, law of logic and, and use that as your starting point. Right. So you just need, I guess, one law or, or one thing that could not have been. I mean, that's always true. That's true everywhere, yeah. universal and immutable. True. We we would say true in every possible world. Every possible so, world. Yeah. yeah. Right. So the fact I exist or James Anderson exists, that's true in in this world, obviously, um, <laughs> and you know, true in other possible worlds you know there are, there are other worlds in which i exist but maybe i'm a bit different than i am here think different things have happened to me but of course there are possible worlds in which i do not exist that james anderson does not exist this particular james anderson there are other people that share my name but this particular james anderson doesn't exist in every possible world uh, so that truth that's true in some worlds but not in other possible worlds but um there are some things that have to be true in every possible world um laws certain laws of logic um, certain mathematic, math, mathematical truths, I think some metaphysical truths, uh, maybe some moral truths as well. Um, so there's a, a, a lot, of, um, lot of truths that one could focus on to get this argument going. Right, right, yeah. 
and that's when i realized or um, understood something when i when i listened to the debate that you guys had the discussion that you guys had the the term divine conceptualism struck me mm. um and and something else struck me because there was the discu- a discussion quite a while ago i guess maybe maybe a couple of years ago with sir roger penrose and william lane craig in the unbelievable podcast mm-hmm. and they were discussing something rather fascinating and i and i think uh it went into divine conceptualism i might be wrong but uh um dr craig was talking about uh, abstract entities the mental entities and physical entities and what unites all of them and it seemed to me uh in some sense the distinction between platonism and divine conceptualism was there in some sort of the same sense in which you and dr malpas were discussing uh, platonism and divine conceptualism so i was i, I guess that, that that made me think is is divine conceptualism also the answer for the unity of mm, the abstract and the physical mm, mm. being united in a, in in the mental aspect? yeah yeah that's um that that's a great question and uh so again probably a little bit of background explanation is needed here so philosophers one of the issues that uh, philosophers debate which goes back at least to plato is whether there are abstract entities of any kind uh that are, are are not not material or physical things but immaterial objects maybe numbers uh maybe truths or propositions um plato has his forms that are these immaterial things that define um essences of of material things so um you know there are different views about abstract entities there's the the nominalist view which simplified says that that um uh there strictly speaking are no abstract entities everything is a sort of concrete particular thing um then there's the platonist view which treats um abstract entities as sort of necessarily existent immaterial objects that perhaps exist in some realm distinct from the physical and then there's there's various positions in between one of which is conceptualism which says that abstract objects are thoughts that they're, they're concepts but of course concepts are our mental category concepts exist in a mind so then the next question is well what kind of a mind do they exist in there are some philosophers who are um what we might say human conceptualists in that they think that um abstract objects exist as human concepts in human minds and if there were no humans then these things wouldn't exist because there would be no human minds but another position which i think is well certainly the one that that i hold and i've defended and and greg welty has defended it even more rigorously in his work is divine conceptualism which is the uh, the idea or the the thesis that um certain kinds of abstract objects like propositions uh possible worlds uh perhaps um properties perhaps numbers uh exist in in the mind of god they're divine concepts of some kind or divine thoughts now what was interesting about the discussion between um uh Roger Penrose and William Lane Craig is that Roger Penrose is not a a theist i mean i think he's probably described as an agnostic maybe tends towards atheism but he he even he recognizes that there has to be more than material stuff there has to be more than the material universe so if i recall from that discussion what what came to light was that penrose accepted three realms so there's the the physical realm physical material stuff then there's the mental realm because he recognizes that consciousness can't be reduced or mind and consciousness can't be reduced to physic uh, to physical brains and physical interactions so that would be the second realm the realm of the mental so first material second the mental realm and then thirdly he wants to put in a realm of mathematical objects because he thinks that there are mathematical truths uh, mathematical entities numbers and the relationships between numbers that can't be reduced to material things but also can't be reduced to a mental category at least if you're only if the only minds that you acknowledge are human minds because there are numbers that are too big for any human being to even conceive of to, to hold in our minds there are mathematical truths that are so complex that no human mind could grasp them uh, but because he's mathematics is very important to him and he thinks that mathematics is an objective 
realm, he has to make it a sort of separate third category from material and mental. And so uh, he, he gets into this uh, discussion with William Lane Craig, and, and, and Craig is arguing that I think the context was that, that uh, God uh, is the best explanation of why the material realm has a mathematical order to it. So why is it that this physical world that we inhabit has this mathematical order and elegance to it in the laws of physics? And, uh, and Craig argues that, um, that, that the existence of God and God creating the universe is, is the best explanation for that. Um, and actually Craig sort of offers um, theism as a way of reconciling or harmonizing these three realms. So you've got the mental, the material and the mathematical and the 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 mental the material realm is is created by god uh, out of his infinite power he creates the, the material realm out of nothing the mental realm well well god of course there god has a mind god has thoughts so there's a sense in which the mental realm exists necessarily in, in the mind of god but also god can create finite minds as well finite consciousnesses and then mathematics can exist eternally and necessarily in the mind of god as well god god's uh, uh we might say numbers uh numbers and the relationships between numbers uh, exist as thoughts in the mind of god and that's really what um uh, Craig was was offering sort of saying to, to Penrose look you've got these three realms the best way to connect them and explain how they are united is the doctrine of um, uh, the doctrine of God and the doctrine of creation um, what's a, a little interesting though is that that Craig in his own work on abstract objects has actually de defended a nominalist position so Craig is sympathetic towards divine conceptualism, but he thinks it's not necessary because he thinks basically you can explain away the existence of abstract objects. So I think he wasn't being entirely consistent with his own work in that discussion with Penrose because he seemed to be pushing or promoting a, uh, a divine conceptualist position, which in other works he's criticized or been rather hesitant to affirm. But anyway... Um, I have no idea the, about think, that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that, that that thank you. Yeah, so so I understood a lot about that because because those two things it immediately came to my mind when you guys talked about that, and I I I thought about the video. It it made a lot of sense in some way. So we we still stuck in the laws of logic, and um, since the law of non-contradiction, you don't really need it because uh, even if you don't need it, you can still apply the fact that there are some necessary truths and use the argument from that. But let's assume for the moment that the law of non-contradiction uh, is, is, is the one that we use for the argument. Um, for, for the sake of our, we use, we use the law. And um, uh, let's assume that there is an unbeliever. I'm talking to an unbeliever. And um, I, I, I use the, uh, the argument from the law of non-contradiction and I use uh, the LNC. And um, he says, well, all right, so you say your worldview justifies or, or rather grounds these laws of logic that you speak of and yet there are um, things in the scripture there are there are certain documents in the scripture that do not or at least on on face value do not seem to adhere to the uh, these laws of logic that you put for the Aristotelian framework I guess uh, for lack of a better term I'd use that the, this is framework of the laws of logic that you put forth uh, let's say he asks me about the, the hypostatic union or maybe even the trinity uh, I'm, I'm just putting those out there. So I guess this is where I'd like to go into your uh, work on the epistemic status of paradoxes. Am I putting that right? So yeah, yeah. So how would how would one respond if 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 an unbeliever does pose this question? Right. So so on the one hand, I'm I'm making this argument. I'm arguing that there 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 are laws of logic, including the law of non-contradiction, and that we can use that as the starting point to. Um, show that God must exist. Um, but in my, in my other work, I've explored the question of theological paradoxes. And this was actually my, my PhD work at the University of Edinburgh, uh, actually inspired partly by my presuppositionalism and some things that Cornelius Van Til said about, um, well, he said, uh, having, having to acknowledge, let, let me try and recall the exact quote. He says, while we while we shun the really contradictory, we embrace the apparently 
contradictory. And he's talking about basically the fact that certain Christian doctrines, such as the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, the doctrine of the incarnation, certain other doctrines as well, maybe to having to do with um, divine sovereignty over uh, human free choices. Um, he thinks that there are certain paradoxes, that's probably the best term to use, paradoxes in Christian theology, and, uh, and that, that this isn't this isn't a bad thing. This isn't a problem. This is actually something that uh, is really part and parcel of Christian doctrine because of the incomprehensibility of God and the element of, of mystery that is always going to be there when we're dealing with um, transcendent matters. Um, so he, he makes these comments about theological paradoxes, but doesn't really develop them or defend the idea. And so what I wanted to do in my doctoral research was to consider two questions. Firstly, are there Christian doctrines that really are paradoxical in the sense that they give the appearance of logical contradiction? So the way I define paradox is something is paradoxical if um, on examination it appears to involve some sort of logical contradiction or inconsistency. Um, that was the first question. Are there, are there theological paradoxes? And secondly, if there are, is it still rational for Christians to believe? those doctrines. And so the first part, really the first half of my uh, doctoral dissertation, which was later published as a book, was arguing that at least the doctrines of the Trinity and the Incarnation are paradoxical when they are taken according to the Orthodox creeds. So uh, if you follow the Nicene Creed and the definition of Chalcedon, I argue that um, the implications of these creeds do, do appear to involve logical contradiction or, or, or paradoxical claims. Um, but then I argued that even if they are paradoxical, it can still be rational to believe them. And I, I basically developed an extension of Alvin Plantinga's reformed epistemology to explain how we know these doctrines are true and how their paradoxical nature doesn't defeat them for us. In other words, that doesn't give us a reason to, to reject them. And, um, and that had to do with um, appealing to the doctrine of analogy, that claims that we make about God are, are analogical to the claims we make about created things, and also an appeal to the doctrine of um, divine incomprehensibility, that, that God is always going to be beyond our rational comprehension. So to circle back to the question, uh, is there is there a problem with in the one in, in one part of my work appealing to of um, uh, theological paradox? Uh, no, there's no conflict because my approach to theological paradox doesn't require us to abandon the law of non-contradiction. Okay, because what I argue is that theological paradoxes are merely apparent contradictions, merely apparent. They appear to involve contradictions, but we, we have good reason to think that they aren't genuine contradictions, that they don't actually violate the law of non-contradiction, even if we're unable to explain how, because there's probably some, some fine uh, metaphysical distinctions that would, uh, would allow us to see why they're consistent, but we, we don't grasp those necessary metaphysical distinctions. So, my, the, I explicitly develop an approach to theological paradox that doesn't require us to deny the law of non-contradiction. We can accept that while also accepting that some claims give the appearance of contradiction without being genuinely contradictory. We might put it this way, they, they appear contradictory to us, but not to God. God, who understands everything perfectly, um, would see why all these truths about him are, are consistent and do not violate the law of non-contradiction. But we're not obviously not in the position of God. Our, our understanding is limited. And so that, that gives rise to these, these paradox for us. And interestingly, you know, these um, paradoxes uh, don't occur just in theology. Uh, we, we get paradoxes in philosophy and different areas of philosophy. We get paradoxes in, um, in science, for example, when, we, when you get down to issues of how to reconcile uh, quantum physics with relativity theory. There are irresolvable, apparently irresolvable conflicts there, and no one has a physical theory yet that can, can explain or um, resolve these uh, conflicts. So uh, it's not just 
theology that has to wrestle with this. Um, there are other areas as well. So I guess uh, the thing to stress on would be the um, creator creation distinction. If, uh, it, um, because yeah, while, uh, while there is quite a lot to unpack there, I'm not entirely sure that I'd be able to explain all of that, but I guess I'd be able to explain the creator creation distinction in as much uh, depth as I can, but yeah, that makes sense. So, yeah. so we'll move on from that. And so we've talked about logic and we've, we've well, threshed, uh, threshed out a bit and we'll move on from the um, loss of logic to, I guess, epistemology, uh, wherein you wrote a paper called the, um, the, the Theistic Preconditions of Knowledge. And in that paper, you discussed epistemic normativity. And there was this quote by John Frame, uh, which, can I just quote it right now? And I'll, I, I'll say why I use that quote. By saying epistemology is a branch of ethics, we remind ourselves in the most vivid way that knowing is not autonomous. It is subject to God's authority, as is all of human life. John Frame in the um, Doctrine of the Knowledge of God. Can epistemic norms be a subset of ethical norms? Uh, and uh, although you use that uh, in, in the paper, I, I was wondering, mm. can, can we really expand on that and really uh, use that in argumentation? Right. So you're really testing me now because you're referring to a paid paper that I wrote, I don't know, some 15 years ago and um, haven't looked at it in a while. And uh, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a academically published paper, but I was trying to respond to a criticism of some presuppositionalists, um, that is a criticism level that presuppositionalists, that we make these claims about God being uh, a necessary precondition of human knowledge, but we, we don't explain why that's the case. So I, I, I laid out some, um, some arguments as to why that would be the case. And I focused in particular, as you, as you rightly say, on the idea of epistemic norms. So an epistemic norm would be um, a norm of how we form beliefs. So not all of our beliefs are rational beliefs and certainly not all of our beliefs count as knowledge. So um, beliefs have to be formed uh, or they, ha they, they have to satisfy certain normative conditions in order to be uh, judged to be rational or justified or count as, as knowledge. And what I argued was that um, that the really the, the best account of why there are epistemic norms is that uh, God has um, designed our cognitive faculties. So if our, if our cognitive faculties are the products of divine design, then obviously there's, there's a right way for them to go and a wrong way for them to go. If there's a divine designer, then they, they can be used in a right way, they can be used in a wrong way. And uh, that gives us some basis for, for epistemic norms. And in a, in a naturalistic worldview, certainly, it's very hard to explain how, they could, how anything could be normative, uh, whether ethically normative or epistemologically normative. Um, but you, you referred to that claim of John Frame that um, epistemological norms can be viewed as ethical norms. So an ethical norm would be what we would generally call a moral norm, a moral standard, something along those lines. And obviously we're very familiar with moral norms. We say, well, this action is morally right, that action is morally wrong. So we have a good grasp of, of uh, ethical normativity. And, yeah, and what and, Frame and, does, yeah, go um, ahead. Oh, um, uh, just, just to put it, uh, I was using that because it seemed so easy if, if that were the case, because uh, ethical norms seem to come naturally to us when we think about that. So that's right. why I asked the question. In yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you know, if we're if we're arguing against um, atheistic worldviews, in particular uh, naturalism, um, then what one of the I think easiest arguments to grasp is an argument from moral norms that we need to explain why there are objective moral norms, why there are right ways to behave and wrong ways to behave, and in a naturalistic worldview, it's very hard to explain why there would be that moral normativity applied to just purely material beings that are not the product of, you know, with the product of chance, natural processes, and so forth. Um, so the, 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 what's called the moral argument for God is a very uh, familiar and easy one to grasp, even though, you know, there's debates about whether it's a good argument or not. But um, I think what, what John Frame is doing there 
is saying that the moral argument can be extended into an epistemological argument. And this is actually how he describes it in his book on apologetics. He starts by talking about the moral argument and God is the ground of moral norms, and then argues that some, um, some epistemological norms or, or intellectual norms can be viewed as ethical norms. For example, one, of, one thing that we would want to say about our beliefs is that we want them to be true, right? I mean, that's the most, really the most important thing about a belief. We want our beliefs to be true. So if we're going to be responsible in using our minds in reasoning well, we want to be aimed at the truth. We might even say that we have a duty, a moral duty to be truth seekers. Um, there are certain moral constraints or moral principles that apply to how we use our minds, how we use our intellects. And one would be, just a desire to know what is true and to avoid what is false. So what Frame argues is that if, if some intellectual norms or epistemological norms are also moral norms, then basically you can extend your moral argument into an epistemological argument and argue that, uh, you know, our reasoning, um, we, you know, that there are, there are moral constraints on how we should reason, how we should use our rationality uh, and our intellects. So that's what he does. Now, I don't think then we have to say that all intellectual norms can be reduced to ethical norms or, or that all epistemological norms are basically just ethical norms. But uh, nonetheless, I think there's some, we might say there's some overlap between ethical norms and epistemological norms. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's how we can connect those two arguments. So um, uh, I'm, I'm structuring our discussion along the lines of the uh, arguments that are used in the transcendental argument. So we use the laws of logic and we've used some sense of, of knowledge. And now we'll move on to something that I'm really fascinated about, which is the uniformity in nature. Mm. Um, and you use that in a lecture of yours. Uh, I, I forget, was it Tar? What are some, some kind of a place that where you, there's a lecture of yours and you, you talk about science and um, science, uh, how science leads to God. And in that you mention uniformity in nature. And then I believe you wrote a book on David Hume uh, and Hume, as we all know, is the proponent, uh, or rather, is the one who talks about the problem of induction. Uh, right. Right. So the uh, uniformity in nature can, as far as I understand it, you cannot use the argument the future resembles the past to say that the future resembles the past. It seems circular. And um, while that does seem true on the surface, uh, can, can't one argue that it's, it's simply the property of matter to, to be predictable in that sense? Well, that, that is begging the question because it's assuming that matter has these properties that uh, act, act in consistent ways or lead to consistent cause and effect relationships over time. So you're sort of smuggling in the uniformity by the back door. If you say that the uniformity of nature is due to the material prop, the, the properties of matter, well, actually, that's the very point in question, whether matter has properties that are consistent over time, over both time and space, because inductive reasoning, when we make a series of uh, empirical observations um, about the way that certain things behave, certain cause and effect relationships, when we reason inductively, we want to reason from particular observations to general laws or general principles. And those laws are supposed to extend across time. So uh, if a law applies in the past, it should also apply in the future and across space as well. In other words, if we do, if we examine, uh, you know, carbon atoms on earth and find that, that they've got certain properties, they behave in certain ways, then inductively, we want to be able to extend that to all carbon atoms everywhere in the universe, right? So we want to um, assume, in essence, we want to be able to assume the uniformity of nature through both time and space, precisely because we can't observe all time and space ourselves. We can only observe a very small, um, really a vanishingly small subset of, of the universe, um, both in time and space. And we want to be able to draw general conclusions about the laws of nature based on these very limited uh, observations. And the assumption of the uniformity of nature sort of licenses that kind of inductive conclusion that we can reason from some relatively small sample of observations 
to general laws that apply everywhere and that allow us to make predictions, that allow us to say that um, if this thing happens today, then something else will happen later today or tomorrow. So, um, you know, we, we, we assume the new uniformity of nature all the time when we assume that, um, you know, when we look at the, the weather uh, reports that are based on observations of the past and predictions about the future, or every time I get in my car and turn the key and expect the engine to start. Now, it doesn't always work that way, but uh, we certainly expect um, ignition systems and engines to, to, to follow consistent laws of nature, at least the laws of physics, to be consistent over time. And the question that Hume raises most famously is uh, how, what, what justifies this assumption of the uniformity of nature in the first place. And he argues that that's not something that's true of pure reason. It's not like a law of logic that had to be the case because it's obvious that, that, that there could have been a universe that's chaotic, that doesn't, um, isn't consistent over time. So uh, the uniformity of nature isn't a truth of pure logic or pure reason, but neither is it something that we know on the basis of observation precisely because we use it to extrapolate from our observations. You, you can't prove the uniformity of nature by inductive reasoning because inductive reasoning depends on the assumption of the uniformity of nature. And Hume at this point pretty much you know, throws up his hands and says, well, if we can't know it by pure logic, and if we can't know it by uh, observations, because he's a strict empiricist, then we can't know it. Uh, so inductive reasoning uh, actually is sort of like an act of faith, a leap of faith with no rational grounding. and. Um, what uh, some presuppositionalists have argued is that uh, the, that assumption of the uniformity of nature in a theistic, Christian theistic worldview is justified. Um, it's justified because um, uh, God himself has uh, established the uniformity of nature and has given us cognitive um, faculties that are fitted to reason well about the world. So um, a, a, a biblical worldview explains, first of all, why, uniform, why nature is uniform, and secondly, how we know that nature is uniform, because to put it in the crudest terms, God has wired us to make that assumption. And because God has wired us to make that assumption, it is rationally justified because it's a true it's a true assumption and god has given it to us and god's the one who knows that it is true i mean um you know god god doesn't need to reason inductively because god being om the omniscient and omnipotent creator of all things he establishes that you that nature is uniform he hasn't he doesn't have to sort of discover it he he establishes it in the first place and because he establishes the uniformity of nature itself and also he is the author of our minds um then we can, we can trust that assumption. We can trust that, uh, call it an intuition if you will, but the intuition that uh, we can reason from the past to the future, that observations about a pa the past will be a reliable guide to the future, generally speaking, um, that all fits perfectly within a biblical worldview, a biblical metaphysic, a biblical epistemology. Whereas if you're a naturalist, you, you don't have any of those resources. You can't explain why the universe is uniform in the first place, that's just a brute fact that there's no, there's no guiding intelligence or creative power behind the universe. It's just a brute fact with no explanation. Um, and, and, and on a naturalist view, um, chaos, a chaotic universe would seem to be even uh, more probable, even more likely than an orderly universe. Uh, if you think about all the possibilities that there could be, uh, an orderly universe is a very, very small subset of all the possible universes that there could be uh, if, once you allow for all the chaotic ones. Um, and also on naturalism, there is no intelligent author of the human mind. So there's no way, even if nature were uniform, there's no way that we could come to know that. It couldn't be um, hardwired into us. Um, uh, we would just have to uh, basically make a, a blind faith uh, assumption. Um, and that's, that's really what the argument is here. So again, to go back to your um, question, uh, if we say, well, you know, nature is uniform because matter has these consistent prop properties, what that really reduces to is nature is uniform because nature is uniform, which of course is not yeah, it's, as again, a purely like circular that. argument. But I've seen that a lot used. Mm. And I just remembered your lecture, it was the loss of nature and nature's God. 
but... yeah that's right it was a, le a lecture um yeah the the, ti the main title was the laws of nature and nature's god um the it was uh, and then it was something like the, the theological foundations of modern science yeah, modern or some, science. something like that yeah, yeah and i yeah i argued in that lecture that in at least three areas there are three aspects of science that um that really um require theological assumptions in order to justify them so staying on this topic for just a moment the uniformity of nature and I, and I and i understand the argument but let's say um, uniformity of nature is usually used uh, in in scientific like, uh, methods, right? So we use we we use the argument for the uniformity of nature when we talk about science. And um, Sir Karl Popper was it who mentioned that his his principle of falsification might destroy the uh, or rather dissolve. I think that was the term used. Dissolve the mm -hmm. problem of induction. I read that somewhere. Some atheist wrote in some blog. I forget. But uh, the argument for it was that, as you know, Karl Popper's argument. Uh, was the principle of falsification, and that that would that would uh, diminish the use of induction, and that and that science would just be about deduction and then falsification. That there is no need for induction. Uh, yeah. Is that is is that view still popular in in academia? Is that is that, is that a still philosophically uh, viable view? I I'm not sure. I mean, um, you know, philosophy of science isn't my main area. And so I, you know, I don't have my finger on the pulse of what uh, philosophers of science today uh, generally um, agree upon. I, I think that uh, many would say that um, falsifiability is one of the marks of science in that uh, if a theory isn't, can't be falsified, then it shouldn't be regarded as a scientific theory. And, and that's one of the main things that I think Popper was getting at. But um, to, to try and resolve the problem of induction by appealing to falsifiability, I think that's far less popular. Um, and the reason for that is that what, what Popper does is uh, by appealing to falsifiability is he doesn't really uh, answer the question that Hume is asking, which is how do we know that nature is uniform? Uh, Popper doesn't give an answer to that question. He doesn't explain how we know that nature is uniform in uh, a priori and how, how, how that assumption can be justified. What in effect he says is, he, he pretty much concedes that we can't know that any law is true. All we can do is keep using it until we discover it's false. So we can, if someone comes up with a hypothesis well here's we made a bunch of observations so let's postulate that there's a law that these uh, these observations follow a law well no matter how many on, on popper's view no matter how many positive confirmations you get of that law you still don't know it's true you still actually don't have a positive justification for that law all you can do is continue to hold it as a hypothesis until it's falsified and then when it's, if it is falsified, then you reject it. You say, well, it wasn't a law after all. But that puts you in this, in this awkward position where, where on Popper's view, we don't actually know that any of the laws of nature are true. We don't have any positive justification for them. All we can do is hope, in essence, hope that they won't be eventually falsified. And, you know, he would say a good scientist is always going to be trying to falsify the laws, you know, because that's how science Go, proceeds. You hold a hypothesis uh, until until it's you you find an observation uh, that falsifies it, and then you reject, come up with some new hypothesis. But all of these positive observations don't actually give you a positive rational justification for holding the law for thinking it's true. So I think that Popper's um, response to the problem of induction is is in effect waving the white flag. And changing the subject. Um, it doesn't actually explain how inductive inferences are rationally justified. I discussed this a bit and maybe you're aware of this. Um, I have a, an article on my website entitled Secular, Secular Responses to the Problem of Induction and I actually wrote it a long, I mean it was like 20 years ago when I was actually a graduate student. Um, so it's, uh, it's not up to date with the, the latest discussions of the problem of induction. But what it does do is it explains what the problem of induction is, um, explains how Hume posed this problem, and uh, evaluates some of the 
most uh, popular secular responses, that is responses that try to answer the problem of induction without appealing to God or to any sort of theological assumptions. And then I, I finish off the article. Well, I, um, I, do, I do address Popper's response in that article. And then when I argue that none of these responses are satisfactory, I indicate at the end that really what we need is a, is a theistic account of inductive reasoning. Uh, why, why, why we should think that nature is uniform and why we should think that our uh, our assumption uh, of that uniformity is rationally justified. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I ask that again because in uh, most popular presuppositional apologists use these three or some forms of these three in their arguments, uh, in their transcendental arguments. Yeah. So, well, I think mostly they're getting that from from Greg Barnson. So Greg Barnson had a sort of triad of arguments that he would often use in his apologetics lectures and debates. Uh, logic, morality, and science. Morality Those and were the science. big three. So, so right. logic, uh, how do you account for logic? How do you account for morality? How do you account for science? And he argued that, you know, the Christian worldview gives an account that other worldviews can't. Right. Yeah. So my final question to you, after we've talked about the transcendental arguments and I've put them aside, there might be way more, but yeah, that's enough for now. And um, we'll, we, we'll, we'll go into one small thing or rather one huge thing, but um, here is the uh, final question that I'd love to ask you. It's about a term you used. It's about, well, yeah, it's, uh, th there's a lecture in sermon audio uh, on Calvinism and the um, first sin. And in oh. that lecture, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I love that lecture because, because for the longest time, I was confused about the, how, how would Calvinism reconcile the uh, problem of evil, especially the first sin? And would, would, would a Calvinistic tradition make God the author of sin? And you mentioned the authorial model and the uh, domino view mm. in that. And you mentioned alpha causation and beta causation. <laughs> now I know we really have, now I know we don't have time to go into all of that, but I'd love for you, if, I'd love it if you could maybe sketch it out a bit, maybe sketch out the differences a bit and uh, explain the authorial model of God's providence in the Calvinistic tradition so that we'll be able to further understand that uh, uh, Calvinism doesn't really make God the author of sin, as many seem to think. Yeah, well, that's a that's a tall order. I mean, I I, I wrote a I know ten thousand word uh, article uh, on all this, um, but the, the 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 basic issue is this, and what I was trying to address in that article was to respond to the claim that um, Calvinism has a particular difficulty with the problem of evil, because on the Calvinist view, um, God doesn't merely permit evil, but God actually ordains evil. So God has an eternal decree that, as the Westminster Confession puts it, will infallibly come to pass. So God decrees all things, including the free actions of his creatures, which of course, of course would include both the the sinful actions as well as the good actions. And uh, a common objection is that uh, Calvinism makes God the author of evil or the author of sin because he ordains these things. And so I was trying to tackle that. And particularly the difficult question of the, of the first sin, of Adam's first sin, um, because uh, you've got the additional problem that, that uh, Adam isn't uh, fallen in sin isn't in bondage to sin in the way that we are and so uh what why would adam a, a good uh, a good human being commit this sin and 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 again the bigger question here has to do with god's ordaining of all things and so what i say is well i think that calvinism is is a form of determinism that is uh, calvinism does does claim that god is the ultimate determiner of all things and that it's probably some form of causal determinism. If, if God decrees something and is able to bring it about, then it seems as though in some sense, God is the cause of all things. And the Westminster Confession again, talks about God being the first cause of all things, although he works through second causes, such as you know, natural forces, but also creatures, agents like, like us. Um, and so, uh, I, say, I, I sort of grant that Calvinism is committed to a kind of causal, divine causal determinism, and I distinguish that from other kinds of determinism, like physical determinism, which is not what we're talking about here, but we're just talking about God being the ultimate cause and determiner of all things. And then I, I consider the question of whether that God makes 
whether that makes God the author of evil in any in any really problematic or morally objectionable sense. And one of the things I say is that um, we need to think about how God relates to other causes within the creation. So um, one way of thinking about God as the first cause is to think of God as like the, the person who tips the first domino in a chain of dominoes. You've probably seen these videos online with these, you know, these elaborate chains of dominoes. And all it takes is for one person to tip the first domino and the first domino knocks over the second domino. And you've got this chain of cause and effect all the way around the, the line of dominoes. Um, but that is, that's what I call the domino model where all of the causes, and I'm going to use my hands here as a sort of a, 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 a illustration of what's going on here are, are happening on the same horizontal level. So you've got uh, the first domino and uh, that is knocked by a, a, a human agent that knocks the, sex, the, the next domino and so on. But the human agent is sort of on the same level, um, metaphysically speaking, as the, as the domino. They're, these are all causes within the creation. And I say that if we think about God on that model, then we're not really understanding the creator-creature distinction. The God isn't like other like causes within the creation. Like if I push you and then you push someone else, you know, uh, we're all causes operating within the created level. But, but God is, is the cause not only of the, the creation itself, but of the causal relations within the creation. So God is, isn't alongside creaturely causes. God is over um, uh, an overarching cause of the entire creation and all its internal causal relationships. So what I'm saying is that divine causes don't operate on the same level as creaturely causes. We need to think of divine causes as, as operating on a higher level than the creaturely causes. And one way to, to sort of think about or conceptualize this is to think of God as the creator as analogous to the author of a, um, of a, um, a story, an author of a novel, maybe like J.R.R. Tolkien. So J.R.R. Tolkien is, in a sense, the creator of Middle Earth because he writes these books and things take place in the story. They take place in this world that he has created as an author. And um, although, for example, Tolkien is the author of things that happen within that world, within that story, um, we don't hold him morally culpable for those things. So I think I use the example of, of Gollum. So, so Gollum's this character who's, you know, basically um, one of the bad guys in the Lord of the Rings story, because uh, he's going after this ring and he's willing to do anything to try and get it, get his precious. Um, and, uh, you know, so Gollum does these things that are, we would regard as bad things, morally bad things. And there's a sense in which he does them because Tolkien has um, written them into the story, made them part of the story. But we recognize that Tolkien is not in the level of the story. Tolkien isn't a character in the story. So it's not as though when Gollum does these things, it's because Tolkien himself is in Middle Earth and making him do these things, you know, putting a gun to his head or something and making making Gollum do these things. Uh, and what's more, Gollum's actions are part of a bigger story that is a morally good story. Although bad things happen in the story, the story as a whole is a good story. And we wouldn't we wouldn't blame Tolkien for the bad things that happen in that story, because in a sense, they're actually necessary to make the story work, to have that good story of, of overcoming obstacles, of courage, of loyalty, of integrity, all the things that are set forth in the um, Lord of the Rings series. Um, so once we recognize that, that, that uh, in a sense, Tolkien is the author of the actions of his creatures uh, that in, uh, in Middle Earth, um, he isn't the author in a morally problematic way, in, in that he is, is in the world causing them to do these things, or that he uh, approves, personally approves of the things that uh, Gollum and the other bad characters, um, 
Saruman and so forth, the bad things that they do. So we want to distinguish between the way in which God is the author of creation and is the author of history, but the ways in which he is not the author of sin or the author of evil in ways that make him sinful or evil or morally culpable for the things that his creatures do. So I, I, I tried to develop this authorial analogy or authorial model of how we think about God's relationship to his creation. And it is an analogy, so it has its limitations. For example, someone's going to say, yeah, Tolkien wrote this book, but, uh, but Middle Earth doesn't exist, right? Uh, it's not, it doesn't exist in the way that Tolkien exists. And there are things that can be said in response to that, for sure. Um, but the, the point of the authorial model is to underscore the fact that God, as the creator, is operating on a different level, causally speaking, than the um, agents within the creation. And that makes a huge difference when we evaluate um, God's supposed culpability for what happens within his creation. He can, he can ordain, uh, this is how some, some of the reformed theologians put it, he, he ordains sin sinlessly. That is, ordaining sin means that sin will take place, but the ordaining of sin is not itself sinful, uh, because God only ordains it for his good purposes as part of what we might call the bigger story of the history of the world. And the, you know, the paradigm example of that would be the crucifixion itself. Scripture says explicitly, Acts chapter 4, Peter says that although uh, the people of Israel and the Gentiles conspired together to crucify Christ, this was a, an evil, a wicked act, they did what God's hand and God's plan had predestined would happen. God ordained that evil action. But of course, God himself is not evil for ordaining that because uh, he orchestrated it uh, as, the, as the means of our salvation uh, and, and bringing glory to himself. So, so that's sort of the, the distinction we're making here between, between ordaining something and uh, causing it uh, in a way that would um, make the person uh, morally culpable for it. Yeah, yeah, I've, al I've always uh, confused both terms the ordaining something to happen and causing something to happen. And yeah, I mean, there's a sense in which ordaining is a kind of causing, but the, the point is we don't want to say it's the same kind of causing as I, I my causing, uh, you know, a, um, a, a pencil to roll along the table. There are different kinds of causes and we shouldn't conflate the two so that, you know, if I, if I caused you to do something sinful, maybe by threatening you, coercing you to do it, that would certainly be bad. You know, I would be uh, sinning in doing that. Yeah. But the way that I would cause you to do it I'm, is not ordaining. I'm not ordaining in the way that God divinely ordains things. It's, a, it's just a different category of causation, I think we want to say. Yeah, once more, moving to the uh, creator-creation distinction that I guess would, would help us a lot because... Yeah. 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 It's, isn't it interesting how we've covered all these different topics in our discussion, and yet we keep coming back to the fundamental creator-creature distinction. Right. It's yeah, just it's so foundational yes. to Christian theology, Christian apologetics, Christian philosophy. And Calvinism stresses on that, which is, which is really... It does, really, I think, really, in the most consistent way. Even way more than uh, Arminianism or the other views. Mm -hmm. I think so. Right. Dr. Anderson... Thank you so much for joining me on this on the on the podcast. It's been a huge pleasure, and I'd love talking with you on all of these. I know it was a bit of a mix, but I really wanted to get all of that out there. So I'm thankful to God and to you, Dr. Anderson, for having come on the show. And I hope to talk to you again, maybe, <laughs> maybe. In well, the I, I'm thankful for the opportunity to speak to you, and I'm I'm very impressed, and and all the reading that you've done and the questions that you're asking is just, yeah, you you did a great job of taking us through some pretty challenging topics thank you dr anderson okay god bless god bless you too if you like this video hit the like button and don't forget to share and subscribe if you want to watch more of dr james anderson's content check out the links in the description below i've put in links to his articles and to some of his discussions as well especially the one with dr alex malpass and that's on parker's podcast got thoughts about the discussion put them in the comments below and I'll see you again next time. Goodbye.